chairpersons for the next session, Dr. Cyrus Shroff and Dr. Natarajan. The session is on what's on the horizon. And our first uh, speaker for the talk for the session is uh, Dr. Avinash Gurbaksani, who will be talking about <laughs> benefits of wide field imaging on the other side, please. Thank you. Is Cyrus here? He's coming? Oh, okay. Hi, Cyrus. Welcome, Cyrus. So I think the first talk is on uh, benefits of wide-angle imaging. So uh, thank you to Dr. Vaishali and the uh, organizers for inviting me here. Uh, so I think I'm uh, preaching to the converted because I'm sure that most of us here use uh, wide field imaging. Uh, and you know, so we've, we've gone from uh, going through uh, the, uh, in, to the uh, 90 diopter and the direct and the indirect to the 45 degree camera to this wide field picture. Now this morning we haven't seen many wide field pictures. So, you know, what, what is it in the periphery uh, that we're, we're looking at? And, uh, you know, uh, Vishali said my topic was the benefits of uh, wide field Im imaging in the clinical practice. So I thought I'll, I'll just reflect on what, how it has affected my uh, clinical practice in, in Dubai. So the wide angle images, uh, imaging systems, you know, th there are a few. The Optos is uh, probably the most popular, the Heidelberg with this uh, attachment. Uh, and uh, the Claris is the new Zeiss one, and there may be a few more which, uh, which I may have missed. We uh, use the Optos and the Heidelberg uh, most often. Uh, there are a few differences between the machines on what they can do. Uh, most of them, uh, most of, uh, and you know, you would want all of them to do uh, everything, but that, that's difficult. And each machine will have its own advantage and disadvantage, you know, uh, based, and we'll, we'll just see what those can be. We always have to keep in mind that these machines use different uh, wavelengths. And uh, uh, so what you might see in one uh, image is not directly correlated uh, in another image from a different machine. Uh, and you know, this sort of uh, tells you what those differences in the wavelength are. So what are the clinical applications that uh, we use the uh, wide field imaging for? So I, I thought I'll go through a case-based approach for this. So this lady with toxoplasma came, uh, you know, she'd had an old toxo lesion uh, down to, uh, inferonasally and then came with a reactivation. So we started her on treatment and, you know, followed her up. But, you know, this completely uh, got out of hand and in spite of treatment, it progressed. Now, I couldn't see anything on, uh, the, uh, on, on slit lamp or with the indirect. But with the Optos, which uh, does not use white light, we were able to see the extent of this uh, uh, toxoplasma. We increased the uh, treatment, changed the treatment, uh, uh, and, and you know, she did very well. And without the, the uh, use of this uh, uh, non-white imaging using the laser, uh, we were able to image this. So that, that made a big difference to the clinical practice. And using this vitreous haze, now again, that, that's the, the gold standard in the future. Um, what about uh, you know, following up patients? Now this, this lady with Irvan came and you know, she's uh, progressed. Uh, you know, uh, and taking serial wide field pictures has been very helpful. You know, I saw her in 2014 and this vessel in the periphery looked pretty normal. Uh, a couple of years later, you could see there was a severe constriction of these vessels. As, uh, as, as this disease is known to produce. I gave her some anti-VEGF. We, we had tried several things and she's been all around the world and seen many uveitis experts. Uh, and the uh, anti-VEGF worked, but of course, uh, temporarily. Uh, what about uh, detachment? It's, it's very useful in clinic to show patients. This patient we saw uh, presented with a detachment with a break uh, superiorly. Uh, and on the Heidelberg, uh, my, my colleague was able to, to find that break there. And then using the OCT, uh, we were able to identify that break quite well. So it's very useful in, in documenting these, uh, these uh, clinical findings. Uh, with the Claris, uh, we don't have a Claris, but with the Claris, it uses true color, with white light, and you might get uh, a, a much better uh, image. Uh, the Claris is about 133 degrees, 
the Optos up to 200 and the Heidelberg 102. Uh, look at this patient with skysis. We, we tried to look at the uh, OCT uh, to identify the skysis, and then you can, you can use that, you can uh, manipulate it, and you can get uh, some very uh, good documentation of the area of skysis using this wide field technique. Uh, fluorescein angiogram, well, you know, especially in, in a uveitis practice, it's, it's very, very uh, Im important. This lady with the TB, uh, all the pathology uh, is in the temporal per periphery there. Uh, and, you know, yeah, I can show you several of these cases. This patient with a hot disc and macular edema, again, you can see a lot of uh, peripheral changes. Uh, and, uh, again, very useful in documenting uh, uh, in, in, Dro capillary dropout and ischemia. Uh, also with the, with the optos, so we use oral fluorescein uh, with children and that's, that seems to work very well. Uh, there's also been efforts to quantify the amount of uh, leakage and uh, you know, in the future looking for uh, quantifi uh, quantification factors. Now, uh, this patient with sarcoid had a, a wide field fluorescein on the Heidelberg and this is the same patient on the same sitting on the uh, Optos, and you can see there is a, a difference in, in the type of image, but uh, it, it, both provide very useful information. This patient has a exudative, uh, peripheral exudative uh, hemorrhage, uh, was referred with query lymphoma, but we were able to identify that this was an eccentric disky form. Chronic CSR, this is the same patient on the, uh, on the Heidelberg using the uh, 55 and the uh, 102 on fluorescein. Uh, diabetic retinopathy, again on the fluorescein with the wide field using the 102 on the Heidelberg, you can find uh, all the areas of ischemia. Uh, same thing on the uh, Optos, this patient came with proliferative retinopathy in both eyes. Uh, we planned for laser and uh, Anti-VEGF, after one anti-VEGF, actually all the changes suddenly disappeared, uh, but the patient also disappeared. Came back six months later, and it was back to what it was, as if nothing had ever happened, and you know, the wide field angiogram was able to tell us uh, the extent of the disease. And then he was treated with laser. Autofluorescence, uh, used a lot of uh, wide field autofluorescence in inherited disease, uveitis, etc. Uh, and uh, uh, this patient was a three-year-old boy who had seen several ophthalmologists and was told there's nothing wrong with his fundus, but uh, his vision was very poor, uh, and he had poor night vision. On the wide field uh, fundus autofluorescence, on the optos, uh, we could identify this uh, hyperautofluorescent ring, and uh, this patient uh, was identified to have a cone rod dystrophy, uh, and these, uh, it's very easy to use in children as well. This patient uh, was referred to me for immunosuppression because uh, they'd seen somebody who said he had pediatric VKH, but of course I didn't feel that uh, this was VKH. On the wide field autofluorescence, again, you can see this is a, a more like a dystrophy. You can see the flex and the hyperautofluorescent ring, and uh, this looks more like a skysis to me. We did genetic testing, and uh, uh, it was confirmed that this child had an NRL mutation. Uh, what about uh, uh, in, in adults with, so this patient presented uh, with the widespread choreoretinal lesions. His vision was good because his fovea was fine and he had this uh, ampigenous sort of choroiditis. Uh, uh, he didn't uh, want to have treatment because his vision was good when I said he needed immunosuppression. He came back three months later and we could uh, show him these new lesions on the white field autofluorescence. And, uh, uh, you know, when I showed him both the pictures, the old and the new, uh, he was convinced that he should be on immunosuppression. In the Heidelberg, of course, we don't have any wide field autofluorescence, but the Claris does have, and with the montage, you can go up to 200 degrees. So these new imaging modalities, you know, are very quick to obtain their relevance in a modern retina practice. I feel that ultra wide field imaging is essential in my practice. It has multiple applications. Now there are limitations. Of course, with the color, the peripheral warp, and ideally, you know, we, we would take the best of all of these imaging systems and incorporate it into one. So I think the best is yet to come in uh, wide field imaging. Thank you. Thank you, Avinash.
Thanks for keeping up the time. And next, I invite Adnan to speak on big data and retinal diseases. And I think you'll be followed by D David Saraf. Uh, great, thank you. Um, the organizers, both uh, local and international, and the local organizers putting on this wonderful meeting. Again, it's my second time at the Rishi meeting. Um, and there's a large team that I uh, too, haven't got enough time to acknowledge to support the data in this talk. So I'm going to quickly go through what is big data, why I'm interested in it, why I think you'll be interested in it. And um, I'm not going to talk about deep learning, but it's uh, a, re a relation to the previous talk about how big data is helping driving the big data, um, the machine learning revolution. Every time we use our phone, we're generating a huge amount of data that's um, adding to this data pool that the big companies are now mining, but I think this will help our healthcare and our management of our patients as well. There's not a precise definition of big data. A simple one is data that's too big for a conventional computer to, to manage, and that's a, obviously an evolving target. And um, our reason I got interested in it is initially um, when we got the anti-VEGF therapies, they were very expensive, and although all patients in the NHS were given the drug, our payers said, we want you to do as well as Anchor and Marina. But we all know when you put a drug in real life and you've got an aging population with overburdened clinics, you're not going to do as well. So I wanted to look at how well we're really doing, and that's how I got interested in it. And rather than look at notes, as I did when I was a resident, to try and look at outcomes, we thought we'd use EMRs. And we were very fortunate in the UK that when I started looking at this in around 2011, we had two very good structured EMRs. Many EMRs in the States have unstructured data, would have free text that, although you can get data out of it, is problematic. There were very structured EMRs in the UK. Uh, one particular, Medisoft, that's now in about two-thirds of the UK eye hospitals that collects a minimum data set when you give an anti-VEGF injection. And it's a bit like doing a, clin case, a, clinical, a, ca a case report form in a clinical trial that you're forced to enter this minimum data set. And so the initial aim was simple, just how well are we doing? And so uh, our first attempt in 2012, we approached 16 centers. And within two months, we got the ethics and all the data in an uh, anonymized format on our servers at Moorfields on over 11,000 wet AMD patients, almost uh, over 90,000 injections, 300,000 patient visits, and 2.8 uh, million data items. And that's our f my first attempt in 2012. So it shows you how powerful it is if you have a good EMR system. Our first two papers were in ophthalmology, and we had patients starting anti-VEGF at the age of 108. So you can see, very simply, we're not going to do as well as Anchor Marina. So we got some very useful demographic information. At the time of our initial paper, which is data from 2007 to 2012, we're doing 3 plus PRN predominantly. Oh, I can't get an, a later. Uh, la uh, here we are. Um, and so um, we had an initial improvement that tailed off. So not as good as Anchor Marina, but with far fewer injections um, than in the original trials. We had about five, four, and four. So we weren't doing terribly, but we weren't doing as well as we should. But one of the advantages of large data sets is we can look at subgroups of data. So in, that, in this line, which is the, the mean over time, we can split this line up into subgroups dependent on their starting visual acuity. So this is how we conventionally, I'm not sure how, yeah, how we conventionally see the data in a pharmaceutical trial. It's changed from baseline. So each of these colors is a subgroup of the total patients by 15 letters starting visual acuity. So we normally conventionally think the guys in purple are doing brilliantly. They're getting 20 letter gains. And the guys in red are doing terribly. They're all losing. But actually, if we plot it, in what's relevant to the patient, which is visual acuity status, the guys that gain vision are the ones with terrible vision to start, and the guys losing vision are the ones with great vision to start. So actually, if you are doing a brilliant job and capturing your patients with 2020 vision with wet AMT so early, they're all going to lose slightly their vision. But they're actually you're doing a great job, and you're going to keep them driving. But on a, on a benchmarking thing, you look terrible compared to Anchor Marina. And this is really important in clinical trials and outcome things. You could fiddle clinical trials on non-inferiority or superiority trials, depending on how you start. And initially, when I showed these data, people said, well, is this a regression to the mean effect? Because if you do repeated measurements, they all tend to go towards the mean. And there are, it's not a baseline and ceiling effect 
there's a continuous effect depending on starting visual acuity. And after years of trying, we finally got the raw data from Anchor Marina, and this is in Presna and the BJO, where we got the control arm. So each of these is subgroups of Anchor Marina pulled together with their control arm, and the delta is the same. So even though you don't get the great gains at good vision, your delta con the control arm is remarkably similar. So your benefits are good at all visual acuities, but your gain is different. And that's really important for future tri clinical trial understanding. And we wanted to know not just how we're doing in the UK, how we are doing internationally. And so we compared our outcomes with my Aussie counterparts, and Mark's not here yet. And they don't have an EMR mining, but they upload a subset of private practice data, not all comers data, private practice data into a uh, uh, a web-based system, and they did treat and extend, and you can see that they're doing much better than we are in the UK. And the, my Indian colleagues will understand the ashes, but for the American colleagues, this is a cricket match between uh, 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 Australia and England, and we, we lost on, on this game badly. So we've altered our practice based on these comparisons to go to more treat and extend since we looked at this data. So treat and extend seems to be a great way forward. However, treat and extend is great for one eye. And what one of my colleagues, Ben Burton, was worried about, when we do treat and extend in the first eye and we're seeing our patient less frequently, we're effectively less frequently monitoring the second eye, and are we doing the second eye harm? And he's absolutely right. So we mine the data, and the longer you follow up the first eye, the worse the presenting visual acuity when they finally develop wet AMD. And since the biggest driver for good outcome or good visual acuity status is your presenting vision, treat and extend actually stops your monitoring of the second eye. So there's a trade-off we need to do. And now we're now looking at other data sources. Now we're now looking at, looking at how we look at getting data from continuous diabetes sugar monitoring, and, uh, IOP monitoring. We're linking our data to genetic databases in the UK, so things like Biobank. And we're looking at um, new imaging technologies. And this is a lovely bit of technology for my colleague Peter Maloka, which is now got two um, machines built, which will uh, image, and one of them's a Heidelberg, and one's the MIMO that takes two seconds to get both eyes simultaneously. The patient puts their head on this OCT, both eyes are scanned within two seconds. There's an AI algorithm that reads the image and then says, yes, there's more thing fluid, and then messages your physician and says, you need another injection. Great. Not, not there yet, Swiss prices, but we hope we'll get there. And so we have all this data. How do we analyze it? We have binocular data in EMR, so we can look at binocular blindness, because that's what affects the patient, and we're improving. We have data on cataract surgery. We've looked at the interaction between diabetic macular edema and cataract surgery. And zero is when they have the cataract surgery. And the, the, the line is the uh, incidence of anti-VEGF requiring DMO. So there's a steady state. As soon as they get the, injection, the cataract surgery, it's not just a few months there's an increased need. There's an increased incidence of needing anti-VEGF for two years after. So there's something that's fundamentally changing when you do cataract surgery. You can only really get, to get an idea of when you get big data. We also have in these EMRs a, a, a semi-structured pseudo-ETRS grade. So we have um, progression rates of diabetic retinopathy on about 60,000 eyes. And these are Kaplan-Meier curves showing incredibly tight confidence intervals on progression rates of retinopathy from baseline retinopathy grade. That's very important in monitoring follow-up visits and clinical trial uh, planning. And we've also looked at interaction between procedures. So we noticed that there seemed to be, in one of my operating lists, uh, um, the odd capsule rupture in patients who had lots of anti-VEGF injections. I wasn't sure if that was us or that was a real effect. And we mined huge amounts of data. Within a week, we got the answer that for every intravitreal injection you do, there's a finite increased risk in PCR rupture rate. And initially, everyone dismissed that, and there has been two independent studies that have shown this. So when you have 10 or more injections, your PCR rupture rate is about the same as a good resident. So it's a, it's a real effect. It's important we counsel the patients about this. We're now moving towards analyzing these data in novel ways. We've combined the real-world outcome data with the ARIDS data set that shows that for um, patients with wet AMD in one eye and dry in the other, um, use of ARIDS vitamins is a dominant cost-effective intervention. 
Um, but big data is not always right. Google trends, uh, flu trends got this disastrously wrong, and it was worse than the CDC at predicting flu outcomes, and they've pulled this, so it's also important about how you analyze the data. And just the last few slides, I'm a few seconds away, uh, uh, big data is going to be very important in uh, driving machine learning, both as we heard from uh, 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 Dr. Begg um, in training algorithms, but also in validating algorithms. So one of the advantages we have in the UK, we have a huge EMR data set of all diabetics having their retinopathy graded on over 2 million, and we've used these images to validate independently uh, machine learning algorithms for diabetic retinopathy in our published data. We did this on over 100,000 images. We're now in the implementation phase and have further validated on 30,000 consecutive patients over 150,000 images with no missed retinopathy at all. So this is going to be rolled out hopefully within the next year in all uh, patients in the UK. Our current data set on over, over 200,000 retina patients is now linked to 42 million individual retinal images. So we have to use machine learning to analyze that to link to the EMR. So that's the real ground truth. And we're now linking it to genetic data. So the latest um, biobank exome data is 55 terabytes that we're going to pull in and try and pull it all together not just to look at simple outcomes, but really to see if we can um, understand and get a personalized medicine approach with a totality of the data for our patients. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Adnan. So there's a change in order. I now request Dr. David Saraf to speak on 3D OCTA volumetric analysis of PD in New AMD. I think it's here, yeah. No, no, I, huh? no, no it's not here. No. It's here. That's twice now. I've had to jump the stage in the middle to get up here quick enough. All right. There we go. So we'll talk about uh, OCTA volumetric analysis of PED. And again, we have a nice image here. I'll show you who that belongs to at the end of, uh, at the, end of the talk. A lioness? That's right. A lot of excitement in there. I should talk about uh, animals, I think, instead of uh, retina. All right, I want, to, I want to acknowledge Adrian O. Oh, he's one of our fellows at Jules Stein that, I've, that has helped me with this project. And he's really been, I think, um, uh, the, the, the one doing all the heavy lifting with uh, what, what the data we'll talk about. So as you know, pigment epithelial detachments can develop either as a result of type 1 or type 3 neovascularization in, in uh, exudative AMD. And type 1 neo, the PED is very different in terms of how it develops. The wrap lesion actually descends from the deep plexus over the crest of the pigment epithelial detachment. Whereas in type 3, uh, with type 1 neovascularization, the neovascularization comes from the choroid and uh, creates the PED from the side or from the edge. And here are some examples. So you can see in type 1, with type 1 neovascularization, uh, you typically will have the neovascularization coming from the side or the edge, and it will often organize under the RPE, whereas in type 3 neovascularization, the lesion descends from the deep plexus over the crest or the apex of the pigment epithelial detachment. And some more examples of type 1 coming from the edge, type 3 coming from the crest. In type 3 neovascularization with pigment epithelial detachment, there'll be a hot spot, an intraretinal hemorrhage with a hot spot, again at the, at the apex of the PED. And then you can see there uh, on uh, OCT, you can see the hyperreflective focus that represents the wrap lesion over the crest of the PED. And some more examples showing multimodal imaging of type 3 or wrap lesions associated with pigment epithelial detachments. On OCTA, again, you can pick up the flow signal which descends from the deep capillary plexus into the RPE, which is broached uh, and, and disrupted, and then leading to exudation and the development of this pigment epithelial detachment. And after uh, treatment with anti-VEGF, you can see a brisk resolution of the pigment epithelial detachment and uh, improvement of the type 3 RAP lesion. 
But what I want to talk today is the evolution and development of type 1 neovascularization uh, with pigment epithelial detachment. And as I mentioned, these develop usually as a hot spot at the edge of the pigment epithelial detachment, as you can see on the fluorescein and ICG angiogram. And then you can see the corresponding focus here coming from the underlying choroid, uh, th from the edge, and then blowing up the pigment epithelial detachment adjacent. And here's some more examples of multimodal imaging, in this case of a type 1 aneurysmal neovascular complex or polypoidal coming from the edge of the PED in this type 1 lesion. And with, in this particular case, collapse of the PED uh, with anti-VEGF therapy. We've been able to identify these lesions with OCT, OCTA very nicely. And again, you can really appreciate these border lesions very nicely with both on fast structural OCT and on fast OCTA. And then you can highlight these lesions and track them as they grow through the pigment epithelial detachment, as you can see in this particular case. And so what we then set out to do was uh, to look at our database of type 1 neovascularization and PDs and analyze the evolution of these lesions through a serous PED and determine the final anatomical outcomes of type 1 NV associated with vascularized serous PED using both on fast OCTA and on fast OCT. This was a retrospective multicenter study. Uh, these patients all had baseline OCTA and follow up with OCTA up to two years. We looked at the visual acuity, the injection history the maximal height and volume of the pigment epithelial detachment, as well as the flow area and progression of that flow area through the pigment epithelial detachment uh, using both volumetric analysis with on fast OCT and on fast OCTA. This was a collaborative study. Uh, Voss and Bailey are, again, uh, collaborators. We had uh, collaborators from Munster, Germany, Tufts in Boston, as well as San Rafael in Milan, in addition to Bailey's uh, 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 center in New York and our center at UCLA. Inclusion criteria was a vascularized Ceres PED with a flow area that was 40% or less than the entire volume of the PED. And outcome criteria was a filled PED with a flow area that comprised 60% or more of the PED. Here are our results. So in total, we had 24 patients. Visual acuity actually declined from about 2040 to 2060. The CNV flow area increased from about 25 to 40 percent. The height of the PED reduced uh, from 373 to th about 300, and so did the volume, although on a smaller scale. And then we identified two important outcomes of, the, uh, uh, of, of these PEDs, a persistent vascularized Ceres PED in one half of the patients and a filled, multilayered PED in the other half of the patients. And here you can see the, that data again plotted in a, in a ta ta table format showing increase in the flow area and reduction in the PED height and volume uh, in the overall cohort. And here in the overall cohort, we plotted the flow area, and you can see this gradual increase in the flow area of these type 1 neovascular lesions with a gradual reduction in the height and volume of the PED. When we compared the two anatomical outcomes, uh, we could see that there was a greater flow area increase in the filled fibrovascular PEDs than in the persistent vascularized serous PEDs, and there was also a much significantly greater reduction in the height and volume in the filled uh, fibrovascular PEDs versus the persistent vascularized serous PEDs. Visual acuity was about the same in terms of the final outcome of these two cohorts, uh, but the filled multilayered fibrovascular group tended, uh, seemed to require seven less injections. And here are some examples of the two anatomical outcomes and the evolution of these lesions. So here's a vascularized Ceres PED, initially comprising only 10% of the pigment epithelial detachment. With follow-up over about one to two years, you can see that it gradually increases uh, from the edge of the PED. But in this particular case, it remained a vascularized Ceres PED, as half our cases did, despite an increase in the flow area. Here's an example of a, a uh, and this is just the same case in high magnification. Here's an example of a vascularized Ceres PED with a neovascular lesion at the edge, as you can see on this volumetric uh, on fast OCT scan. Subsequent follow-up shows complete filling of the pigment epithelial detachment and collapse 
of the PED in this second cohort that became a filled, multi-layered PED. In this particular instance, the neovascular lesion again filled the pigment epithelial detachment in a multi-layered uh, morphology, but the height of the PED was retained. So this was a filled, multi-layered PED with a retention in the height of the pigment epithelial detachment, and you can see that here on high mag. And another example of a, ne a type 1 neovascular lesion filling the entire PED, but in this case collapsing the pigment epithelial detachment, uh, but still the, the multilayered uh, fibrovascular appearance. So this multilayered appearance is a ver very interesting to us. We've described this before. These patients have uh, three layers, a fibrovascular, fibrocellular, and, and a component of fluid. And you can see that, uh, that this was essentially half of our cohort. So the, the, the filled fibrovascular PED either collapsed into a multilayered into a multilayered PED, or retained its height and volume uh, with this organiz this fibrovascular organization underneath. And another example going from the vascularized serous to the filled multilayered morphology. This multi-layered morphology has been actually characterized by Christine Curcio, and as I mentioned, this layer is fibrovascular, this is the fibrocellular component, and here is the fluid that comprised about half of our outcomes. So in conclusion, type 1 NV go grows from the edge of the PED progressively along the RPE monolayer and fills the PED in a multi-layered multi configuration in 50% of our cases. Uh, there were two anatomical uh, uh, outcomes, the filled multilayered PED, which we think is a more stable morphology, and the persistent vascularized serous PED, which was a more unstable morphology that required more injections and maybe greater risk of tear. The CNV progressively grows in both groups, but tends to be a much sig more significant growth rate in the, in the filled uh, multilayered PED in which you have an organi organized fibrovascular lesion underneath the PED that uh, tends to be reduced in height. And this may be a more stable anatomical outcome requiring less injections. It's unclear why some of these PEDs remain in a vascularized serous PED while the other half tends to organize in this fibrocellular and fibrovascular format. Uh, but it may be a, a, an issue of the different angiogenic cytokines. There are um, connective tissue cytokines such as CTGF and platelet-derived uh, growth factor, which may promote fibrovascular and fibrocellular organization, and these may be more operative uh, in the PEDs that collapse into this multilayered format. Thanks very much for your attention. Oh, Th thank you. and this uh, paw, I just, one last thing, belonged to this beautiful uh, Royal Bengal tiger that we were able to see. Oh, can you put that back up for one second? Can you put that up for one second? Can you put his slides back? I made the right diagnosis, David. Yes, the Royal Bengal tiger. So my wife took this picture and this tiger actually came within just a few feet of our Jeep. Uh, when he was strolling uh, by back into the marsh area. So thanks to Vishali and to Voss for uh, encouraging me to come and to see this, which was one of the most awe-inspiring moments of my life, I have to say. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, David, and, and uh, fascinating talk. Unfortunately, uh, the structure of the session is such that we really don't have uh, time for questions, so we'll have to move on to the next talk, which is Robert. Uh, Dr. Mark Dismet in Robotics, the Future of Vitreo Retinal Surgery. Thank you very much. Um, thanks, Vishali, for inviting me. It's uh, nice to be back here in India, and uh, this is the second time I'm here in uh, Jaipur. The last time was just after finishing my fellowship exams wearing sandals and a uh, backpack. I'm the co founder of Precise, so what I'm going to do in this talk is give you an overview of robotics in vitreo retinal surgery. And I'll be giving another talk in the coming few days in which I'll give you a little bit more about the clinical data that we've accumulated so far. It won't come as a surprise to you that VR surgery is in fact a very complicated and, uh, and difficult field that requires a lot of precision. If we look at the internal limiting membranes, they measure about 2.5 microns in uh, thickness, epiretinal membrane 60. We're dealing with also a certain breathing frequency which causes some uh, motion inside the retina. 
the forces that were required in order to carry out many of the tasks that we are trying to generate are very small in the area of millinewtons. The peeling force is 8 to 12, but you can start tearing and causing hemorrhages with just a, uh, a force of about 5 uh, millinewtons. And you have to deal with physiologic tremor, both in dynamic, which is about 100 uh, microns at best, Physiologic tremors in a static mode, which is about 250 microns because they're micro jerks. This plays a particular role if you're trying to inject into the subretinal space. And there are other things, such as the ability to have a generate a certain velocity and, um, and uh, with regards to a surgery. These are the challenges for the surgeon. If you want to now start thinking about robotics, there are other types of challenges also. For example, ergonomy the design that you're going to use, uh, how it integrates inside the OR, what is its specific use, is it going to assist the surgeon, is it going to replace the surgeon, does it have to be able to enhance him, his abilities, of course it has to be safe, and one big question is of course adoption, if you design such a system and we've been busy for more than 10 years, will it really be adopted? These are the main approaches in ophthalmology at present. There is what's called the handheld instruments. These essentially cancel your tremor. They can add your uh, uh, help you with precision, but they essentially are instrument dependent. There is a co-manipulation approach which assists you when you're doing surgery, but you're, you're still, it helps you mainly with static tasks. Telemanipulation gives you a lot of uh, flexibility. And there are some that are being uh, considered for either specific tasks or really a, a for the future. This is a non-contact approach where in fact a needle is brought close to the eye and without any contact at the right time would be able to penetrate through the sclera and give an injection. It's being developed in fact to deliver anti-VEGF. And on the other side here you have magnetic bead technology being developed in uh, Zurich in Switzerland where with magnets you'd be able to display small uh, d devices that are inside the eye that potentially might be able to dissect away membranes but require a fairly large magnet and occupy a lot of space, so it needs a dedicated OR. Here are the differences between the different concepts. Um, uh, you'll see here that we talk a lot about dynamic versus static tasks. We look at the ability to automate. All of these are able to tremor, uh, to filter tremor uh, away, so they increase your precision as you do surgery. Some of these are able to do both and may be able to also work with remote control, which means that you might be able to fully automate surgery at some point. A better comparison here looks at things such as motion scaling, that is the ability to move fast in certain parts of the eye, more slowly when you want to do a dedicated task, very important because otherwise you get tired of trying to reach a specific uh, spot from the uh, periphery. The two main area, uh, the systems that are being used, co-manipulation and telemanipulation, use a remote center of motion. And what remote center of motion means is that you have a pivot outside the eye. You're using the entry point inside the eye as the point of rotation so that there's no distortion that occurs. And this is how we should mainly operate although on occasion it may be necessary to be able to tilt the eye. And so an ideal system should be able to do both, and our setup does allow us to do that. We use the insertion point as being the point of reference. You can see that there's a lot of reach that is possible within the eye, particularly from the temporal side as compared to the nasal side. Originally, we designed both arms. We've only developed so far one arm, since we think that the main uh, use of a robot at this stage is to assist the surgeon in specific tasks during surgery. But again, we do have a large reach. We do use a dedicated headrest that allows us also to be able to move the eye around as, uh, as, we, uh, as needed. And uh, you can see here, we've also taken into account more or less 95% of European heads. This is what this particular model represents, which represents more or less what is present in the world, except for a few exceptions, probably people from the Sahara Desert that have very deep eyes, or Eskimos from uh, northern Canada. This is one of the original uh, experiments that were done to try and peel. This is an allantoic membrane, a, a model for um, um, uh, epiretinal membranes. The uh, procedure pr uh, works well, but you see some jerkiness. This is a video from about five years ago that jerkiness has been removed. This is an initial experiment at doing cannulations, again, in a vein. You can see that this is a very uh, uh, 
uh, directed uh, motion, we're going to inject some air into the, the vein itself, as you can see here. And this led us, in fact, to try cannulations in an animal model in pigs. We've been able to succeed over 90% of cannulations and be able to inject, in fact, um, uh, a, a medication that was able to get rid of uh, occlusions um, in uh, pig eyes. Now, we've used our system in patients. There were 17 patients operated to date. The first uh, six were operated in Oxford that, uh, 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 in fact, uh, through a company paid for a, the building of a clinical grade machine. This is the OR table in Oxford, in the OR, the uh, setup, the control arm that has to be used in order to manipulate the, uh, the uh, uh, robot itself is present here on the side. The robot is sitting uh, unobtrusively next to the patient head, which allows, in fact, the surgeon, after everything has been set up and the patient is brought into the operating room, to carry out the operation as, much, uh, as far as he wants. He then brings this device into position. It's uh, um, fixed onto the uh, temporal trocar, and this allows him then to be able to uh, perform the surgery using the uh, uh, manipulator that is present here on the side. He just has to extend his arm into that direction. Uh, one second, let me go back. So here you have tremor comparison. You can see the difference between what is uh, done robotically versus manually. There's a lot more motion if you do it manually. Obviously, this will take a little bit more time, but one of the big differences is that in terms of the microhemorrhages that are generated as you're trying to, call, uh, trying to peel, five out of six patients that were done manually had some microhemorrhages, one to, uh, to two, while in fact only two patients in the robotic-assisted uh, group developed uh, uh, these microhemorrhages. You can see here the setup on the outside of the eye. The motion here that you see in the eye itself, this is a patient under anesthesia, is due to the heart uh, rate. Um, and the motions that are being generated at the level uh, just above the retina, I've been you can see the translation that is occurring here with the, uh, the device itself being in position. The manipulation is done, as you can see here on the side, and the robot essentially carries out the task inside the eye. We do record information, so this allows for training, so you can look at uh, how much standby has occurred. The more experience you have, the less you sit in standby. The slower is, uh, is your motion, you do less clutch uh, um, uh, motion. We can check essentially how quickly somebody moves from the periphery to the site of action, which can be helpful in trying to train people. We've also used it externally to try and inject into the subretinal space. This was a, uh, an attempt to place some uh, uh, some viscoelastic just uh, under the, uh, the retina. Difficult to do, handheld, you get a lot of bleeding, but as you can see here, there is very little bleeding. The approach is different. We just get between two vessels, progressively uh, move progressively deeper, and from a, an inside view, you can see that we're able to inject um, viscoelastic easily. Um, this was done by an experienced surgeon, myself, with uh, a, more than 95% success. On the other hand, uh, using this system, 100% success was achieved by a, uh, a non-surgeon, in fact, just a technician. So in our current directions, we're trying to develop software so that we can enhance what I would call procedural steps within surgery. There are different uh, steps that you carry out. So for example, fluid gas exchange, uh, staining, the ability to peel, the ability to induce a poster vitreous detachment. We want to be able to automate some of these procedures. We're going to integrate vision, particularly in the, uh, placing an OCT scan directly inside the instruments. That increases our precision. It lets us see the size of the retina, the position of the retina, and we're going to try and develop more robocentric instrumentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mark. And uh, next have Dr. Vas Sada. Uh, be speaking on revisiting the normal retinal circulation insights from high resolution OCTA. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so if I didn't test my talk, so I don't know if the movies will play, but we'll see what happens. Okay, so these are my uh, relevant uh, disclosures. Uh, and so, uh, so I will say that, uh, that you know, OCTA and geography, uh, you know, has been 
quite amazing in terms of how it's helped us better understand the three-dimensional nature of the retinal circulation. That's been an important benefit, but it's also created a great debate uh, in terms of the organization of the retinal circulation. Uh, there's been a lot of controversy about whether the retinal circulation is organized in series versus parallel. Uh, and, and some people have started to ask, well, why do we care so much? Why are people so emotionally invested into the, uh, into the layered uh, circulation? And one of the reasons we care about how many layers there are in this retinal circulation is that it may give us some insight into a spectrum of diseases. We've talked a little bit about this today. You know, we think that superficial capillary ischemia leads to nerve fiber layer infarcts. David Seraf has shown that internuclear infarcts can be produced by, by uh, injury or, or ischemia in, in deeper circulations. Then, of course, uh, there's this thought that perhaps uh, the injury to the deepest circulation may uh, actually uh, be a contributor to AMN. That's a bit more controversial because the choriocapillaris may play a role as well. So then the question becomes, well, how many layers are there in the retinal circulation? How do we figure this out? What actually defines a layer? Uh, and actually, uh, you know, one of the concepts that's worth talking about, uh, which I want to introduce, which we, which we believe is going to be a very useful technique to look at OCTA data, is this concept of ax axial vascular profile analysis. We heard a lot of talks today about quantifying vessel density, quantifying things like the FAZ on the on the on FOSS images. But rather than look at the OCTA, da OCTA data quantitatively from an on FOSS image, axial vascular profile analysis uh, means that we're going to be looking at this along the dimension of the A scan, the direction of the A scan. So if you plot the capillary density along the A scan, you get this type of a profile. And essentially, you can say, well, wherever I see a peak or an increase in density, I will call that a vascular layer. And then, of course, the interconnecting areas, there'll be a lower density. Those are sort of the troughs uh, that we see. So that's one potential way that one can establish the number of layers there are in the retinal circulation by looking at regional peaks of a vessel density. In fact, this was done to good effect by David Wong's group. They published in Nature Scientific Reports uh, last year uh, about looking at the retinal circulation in different regions. And they, in fact, observed that how many peaks you saw or how many layers you saw really depended on where you were. For example, uh, near, the, near the optic nerve, they could actually identify four peaks, uh, whereas in the periphery, they only saw two peaks. And then closer to the foveal center, they observed uh, three peaks. And, and based on this, they came up with a, uh, a nomenclature that many of us use. Actually, this has been since modified. I'll explain that in, in a moment. Uh, but, uh, but roughly dividing the circulation to superficial and deep components, and then subdividing the the superficial and deep vascular complex into these various plexi uh, that you see here. And that's, again, a nomenclature that, that was adopted. So uh, at the same time, it's worth pointing out that there are many factors which actually can uh, uh, affect how we appreciate the retinal circulation. Uh, we've already had some mention about projection artifact. That's a big factor. But image quality is a huge issue when it comes to OCT and geography. It's why, uh, for example, we've published on using image averaging to improve the quality. Uh, some manufacturers actually use a technique of splitting the spectrum, uh, which is a nice way of improving the signal to noise. But it does come at the expense of reducing reducing axial resolution. I'll say more about axial resolution. Another strategy that some manufacturers use, which is kind of a type of averaging of sorts, is a probabilistic approach, where they just obtain multiple frames until they're confident that there actually is flow or no flow at a particular location. And the other thing that I think is very important in terms of our understanding of the microcirculation is resolution, uh, both transverse and axial, as I'll try to illustrate. So I did mention this issue of projection artifact. And, and again, this is an on FOSS lab obtained through the deeper aspect of the retinal circulation. But notice the projection artifact from the larger superficial vessels. And of course, now uh, many manufacturers have developed uh, uh, what appear to be effective projection artifact removal tools. Again, some of these lack um, true histologic validation, so, so I always have some uncertainty, are we actually uh, potentially removing real data there? In any event, uh, you know, resolution is relevant uh, because capillaries are actually uh, quite small, and even the distances between the circulations are quite small. So you can imagine that if you're going to image the circulation in its three-dimensional aspect, you really have to make sure that your axial resolution matches uh, the, uh, the, uh, these capillary sizes and dimensions uh, that are relevant. And just to sort of illustrate the impact of resolution on these types of profiles, uh, you know, a nice place to look is in the more peripheral retina where the vessel layers are kind of closer together. Uh, and if you look at the profile in these areas, you can see that if you actually stick with full spectrum data, 
not splitting the spectrum, you can still resolve three peaks even in the more peripheral areas. But notice what happens as you start to drop the resolution. Uh, you can see that these peaks become less apparent. They kind of fuse together. So res this is just to highlight that resolution does make a difference in terms of our appreciation of the circulation. So, so what is exactly is this uh, impact? So to study this, we said, well, why start with uh, technology that might give you some reduction in axial resolution, let's pick the maximum resolution that we can, and that, uh, that's something that's available, for example, in the spectralis device, full spectrum, but also it's a very high um, uh, density in terms of the number of A scans, and Bailey earlier talked about doing very high density sort of OCTA acquisition, but these are volumes that I'm going to be talking about. So again, uh, we can use the projection artifact removal, so when you go to the deeper aspects of the circulation, you can appreciate how the vessels are removed, they don't seem to impair that. Uh, but in any event, uh, we did apply that, uh, and what we did is we looked at these axial vascular profiles, but we acquired them in specific regions. You can see these red boxes, uh, both parafoveally close to the foveal center and sort of more in the outer aspects of the macula. So we sampled these profiles in these locations. What did we observe? Well, you could produce these types of profile maps stretching from the nerve fiber layer to the outer plexiform layer. I think you can appreciate that we could see these, uh, these uh, three peaks, for, in the, for example, in this uh, particular um, um, overall summary of the cohort, but notice, uh, and again, just to show you what you're looking at, the green line is the mean of the population, the green dotted lines are the standard deviation, and then the individual gray lines are the, all of the different subjects. Uh, in, the, in the study. And then you can see when we apply, this is without projection artifact removal. When we applied the projection artifact removal, notice that things kind of come together and you can actually see a reduction in the, in the vessels in the, in the, uh, in the, uh, in the uh, intervening layers. So that just highlights the fact that the projection removal was quite effective. It also kind of tightens up the peaks. This is all those published in Nature Scientific reports earlier uh, this year. Uh, and, but what we, what we observed was though that this higher resolution approach did affect the number of peaks that we could appreciate in the retinal circulation. You can see that, that in the, in the, in the perifoveal area, this is sort of the more distant aspects of the macula, you can see that, that there are actually only three peaks in all these different locations, but you can see that the temporal portion of the perifoveal macula was quite different from the superior nasal inferior portions. And this entirely reflects the nerve fiber layer. Uh, and so wherever the nerve fiber layer is thickest, you see a shift uh, towards uh, that, uh, that uh, structure. And it highlights that the superficial plexus really is probably better term, rather than radial parapathic capillary plexus, most of us have used uh, this new term, nerve fiber layer plexus, to refer to that most superficial vascular layer. It really does reflect that. But what was most interesting was looking at the parafoveal macula, where actually we could see that even in the parafoveal macula, we could actually resolve four peaks, in fact, that you could still divide the super circu superficial circulation into two peaks using this high resolution approach. Now, now um, you know, what is the mechanism? Again, we think it's because of the higher axial resolution, but really we don't know for sure. But we do think that there is merit to this, this axial vascular profile analysis approach. You can see us sweeping across the macula. You can see the shape as uh, changing the shapes of the peaks. What we're excited about is the opportunity to study different diseases using this type of approach, which lends itself to a different type of quantum quantification than you can achieve with on FOSS approaches. In fact, these are annular rings that were obtained in these locations. This is a heat map showing the vessel density, so you can really appreciate these four bands corresponding to the four layers, but notice how the position can change regionally. So these are really nice ways, I think, of studying and probing uh, the, the three-dimensional aspect of the, of, the, of the retinal circulation. And again, the real critical and interesting thing, which I can't show you yet, is, is what do we see in the setting of different diseases. Uh, also, when we sweep into the more peripheral aspect of the circulation, we can see even far peripherally in the far temporal um, uh, uh, portions of the retina, we can still resolve three peaks using this high resolution approach. They do come closer together, but you can still uh, resolve them. Uh, and in fact, now we're able to actually quantify retinal vessel density within specific structural layers, which I think is going to be a useful approach, especially in diabetes and other diseases. It's very hard to figure out what layer you're looking at when there's drill or other abnormalities. And we think this is going to be a useful tool uh, in that regard. Also, uh, you know, I think that one of the things that we learned, and I'm just going to go over by a few seconds uh, to talk about this, uh, uh, by doing this high resolution approach is, you know, we were very puzzled when we saw the initial paper from David Wong's group where the ICP and the DCP looked very similar. 
And that was actually surprising to us. Uh, and actually, if we take the, the, the deep vascular complex uh, and you actually try to resolve it using this approach, you can see that the ICP actually looks quite different from the DCP. Just look at this vessel in particular. And if I go to the DCP, you'll see that that vessel is in fact not present. That tells you that you're actually separating these two vascular layers. And in fact, the, mor the, 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 the morphology of the DCP, which Alain Godric very nicely called this sort of vortexing sort of pattern, is very characteristic and really is a clue to tell you that you are in the DCP, in, in fact. So to summarize, uh, I think that uh, there is, resolution is an important aspect in being able to accurately evaluate the 3D circulation. And I do think this axial vascular profile analysis may be a useful assessment tool. As I said, we've learned about more layers closer to the fovea, as well as now we've reclassified that most superficial layer as the nerve fiber uh, plexus. I want to acknowledge my fellows who really did the hard work and heavy lifting on this project. Thank you. Thanks, Vas. And uh, we next have uh, Dr. Rupesh Agarwal. And uh, he will be speaking on revisiting the pathogenesis of diabetic retinopathy, newer insights. Sorry for the delay. Thanks, Dr. Vishali, Dr. Vas, and uh, the BRSI for having me here. Again, I'm, uh, I'm not, not a retina specialist. That's a disclaimer from me. But have some interest in research. And uh, we have been talking about uh, some of the very fancy things since morning. And some of which we are using OCT, OCTA, big data. But let's get to the basics. This is even more fundamental and then something which we have not, never discussed. So two years before in RISI-1 and RISI-2, I have described and we have detailed about CVI. And what was CVI was about looking into the interior of choroid. Now let's look into the interior of retinal vessels. We have been since morning talking about the signals coming from the OCTA. Now what is the fundamental ground rule of OCTA? Now this is where we need to think about. There is something called as microvascular blood viscosity. Now when you talk about the blood viscosity or the blood flow, there are two components in that. One component is something which we all have been studying and these are some of the images, the OCTA images which we have been following up, the capillary density, the vascular density. But what we have been ignoring is the blood flow within the blood vessel. Now let me go back to the previous slide. In the previous slide, if you see this principle of physics, where there is R is equivalent to resistance, and resistance is inversely proportional to the four power di diameter. Now, that requires four unit change in the diameter to cause a single unit change in resistance, inversely proportional. But when you compare it with the viscosity, which is mu, a single unit change in the mu can lead to a change in the resistance. So it is directly proportional. But have we actually worked on the mu, or which is the viscosity, and that's something which we are going to go, go inside the retinal blood vessel and see what is happening within a blood or within the blood vessel which can constitute the viscosity. Now, if you look at this image again, now thanks to this image from Adnan, sorry Adnan, this is from some of the modification is done. And if you look at this blood flow within the blood vessel wall, now this is the red blood cell which is going across. But there is a space between the blood flow and the blood layer wall. And this is what Dr. Jose was trying to ask about the FAZ this morning. And this is the tank trading motion of the RBC. So these are the healthy RBCs which are moving. And there is a space which need to be maintained. And there is a lot of biochemistry involved about the nitric oxide and all why this blood layer is maintained. And we can see that layer within this. Now this is because of a factor called as rheology of the blood or rheology of the RBCs. Now this is how a rheology of the RBCs, if there is some abnormality here, that is there is RBC swelling or uh, altered rheology of the blood 
it can lead to increased plasma or increased viscosity in the blood and subsequently which can lead to decreased capillary flow. Now what we have been measuring on the OCTA is the capillary indices or the blood vessel here but this is the fundamental thing which is affecting these indices here. And this is in turn which manifests in the form of clinical changes which we see every day in our fundus picture and that is what gives rise to proliferative diabetic retinopathy. The objective here is to understand something what's happening at this cellular level. Now to understand this, I put down this uh, postulation or a hypothesis here and this is from one of the work which we published with uh, Singapore Eye Research Institute and you can see here there is on the OCTA we can see the continuous loss of FAZ or the distortion but again I have tried to uh, kind of create some kind of pictures here for you to understand what must be happening inside. So this is a good kind of a flexible RBC, red blood cell and if you go across and this is like a rigid RBC. So probably this is what which is happening the, in the terms of increasing rigidity of our RBC. You can see how from a normal healthy control moving to a diabetic PDR patient how a RBC can become rigid and which can affect in turn the vessels which are the signals which are coming from OCTA. This is just a hypothesis for which we started working on and we wanted to understand more detail about it. So what we did in our study outline, we did these pictures and also started looking at some of the parameters which will help us understand this RBC flow properties. So these are some of the slit channels, microfluidic slit channels which we wanted to create like our normal retinal vasculature and then want to understand what's happening in vitro. So this is not in vivo, what we wanted to see is in vitro. Now here we did two approach, one we analyzed a single cell approach and then second we took all the blood cells together. So in the, all the cells when we did together, this is using a commercially available machine which is called as ICTA cytometer which is not used and it is mainly used for research. We were able to see there is an increased rigidity of the RBC with the increasing grade of diabetic retinopathy. Now here you can see this is the elongation index of our RBC. That means how much stretch you can do on the RBC. And you can see there is an increasing, decreasing trend of the DI as the diabetic retinopathy versions. When we go to the single cell and we wanted to validate using a single cell, we created this microfluidic slit channels. And you can see how uh, into the slit, how a RBC will move. Now this is a single RBC which is coming in the center and again it is moving and we are able to take the pictures of it. Now this is what which is happening here and we put down and code using the MATLAB code to average out this image to calculate what is called as elongation index and we filtered out some of the unwanted images from it and only accepted the cell which has passed through all the channels just to accept the, some, some of the important cells and not to take any kind of uh, false measurements there. And that is where we came out with a single cell deformability index measurement. And you can see this is the control group and this is the proliferative diabetic retinopathy group. And you can see a change towards the left. There is a shift of the axis towards the left. This is the normal deformability index, but there is a change towards the left, which shows that with the increasing diabetic retinopathy, the, the RBCs are becoming rigid. Now this is also shown on this kind of a variability plot which you can see a very nice central curve on the control group. But when you come to the diabetic retinopathy group, proliferative, there are two peaks. Now we are not being able to understand why there are two peaks, but one of the peaks is definitely moving towards the left. Now with that, we came to the conclusion that probably RBCs have a role to play in kind of pathogenesis of diabetic retinopathy, and which is what, which is giving signals on the OCTA probably. And this is what we wanted to understand, and with that, what is our future role or what is our future goal is to analyze all this thing into a one single study where we are doing this imaging which is in vivo and at the same time we are planning to do some of the biomechanical properties in vitro which will be the aim one of characterizing multiparametric using molecular level at the molecular level deformability indices and then to characterize the diabetic retinopathy at the tissue level which is using some of the toys which we are already having in the clinic. And with that, as uh, one of the speaker, Professor Judy Lim, did said that you need to follow up this patient 
and we are also going to probably follow up this patient over three to four time points to see what are the changes happening within the RBCs and also on the images to understand this picture better. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ru Rupesh. Uh, we next have uh, Dr. Kim Ramaswamy. The, he'll be speaking on application of artificial intelligence in diabetic retinopathy. So another thing on big data and artificial intelligence. Thank you. At the outset, I want to thank Dr. Vishali for uh, giving me this opportunity to speak here on this important meeting. Uh, we have been hearing about uh, AI a lot, and uh, what is AI? I'm sure this is maybe a little basic for most of the audience here, but on every day we use AI without our knowledge. We have been using AI for simple as uh, Google Photos or any of those that you're using uh, with the phone, uh, you're using AI. Uh, the human learning comes from the books and all the training that happens, which we call as human intelligence, and what we train uh, the machines with data we call it as artificial intelligence. And this is a machine learning technique that learns features and tasks directly from the data, and the data can be in any form. So we subject a set of labeled data sets to the system which learns from the raw heterogeneous data without much, with some calculations that engineering that happens and recognizes the structure as a car or whatever that it is being subjected to. As uh, uh, pointed out earlier, artificial intelligence came back, uh, was uh, identified earlier, way back in 1950s, and uh, went away and then uh, has evolved with machine learning and recently with the deep learning, a lot of activities are happening. So why deep learning in uh, AI? Uh, the demand supply mismatch we all know or are aware of, especially in countries like India where we have few ophthalmologists to manage the uh, large epidemic of diabetes or the diabetic retinopathy that's coming up. So we've been uh, working on this DR screening, telescreening for the last two decades where you do a manual DR screening of the patient, of the images that are being referred with certain, the problem with this here is the paucity of uh, the uh, trained graders or the retina specialists to read these images and send a report back. What's more important to see is the inconsistency in the grading that happens uh, when in one of this, this Google study itself, it was shown uh, when we subjected uh, the images, the same set of images to 30 different ophthalmologists and you can see the variability where even one of the uh, PDR was diagnosed in an image much uh, which everybody diagnosed as mild and PDR or no uh, uh, DR. So in such situations, and even the same uh, uh, ophthalmologist at two different points of time could be grading it differently. Or the, so this, this inconsistency will make it, uh, uh, every time when you do the grading, there's, there's a probable uh, mistakes that can happen. So how AI can help doctors from preventing um, uh, misreading these, or uh, misgrading these, uh, images. So we do have a standard grading system. What we did with the Google was to develop this algorithm uh, where the initial part was with developing the algorithm uh, using a large set of data images and subsequently there was a clinical validation that was done which showed that the AI was as sensitive as 97 percent uh, for detecting referable diabetic retinopathy. So the simple tool, you just drag the image and within a few seconds, the algorithm gives you the data of what severity level it is and same thing works for the DME too. So it gives you the level of presence of DME or absence of DME and also the severity of the diabetic retinopathy. But what was uh, surprising was that in the process, uh, they also found the cardiovascular risk factors, they were able to uh, identify the gender of the image uh, as a male or female by 97% accuracy, and uh, uh, the various things like HbA1c uh, or the uh, systolic blood pressure, and uh, of course the five-year cardiovascular risk factor. This was done with especially the UK's biobank data that the, this, this was studied. 
And for the first time in the history, uh, in April this year, uh, one of the first AI app for any healthcare was approved by FDA uh, in by the IDX uh, by the Mike, Michael Abramoff group, which is similar to uh, subjecting for uh, the images for diabetic retinopathy and identifying them as the severity of the diabetic retinopathy. Uh, so this is. So recently we have finished a, a validation of the deep learning algorithm in two different centers where we prospectively validated the performance of this uh, Google's algorithm across two sites at Shankarnetralia and Arvind uh, Hospital where we studied about 3,050 diabetic patients uh, in, in the last year. The patient's data came from different uh, uh, groups and the fundus images were tra uh, graded by the trained graders and by the ophthalmologist, trained ophthalmologist, all separately, and then by the Google's algorithm. As I said, these were 45 degree uh, images that came from the non-mediatic camera, grading done by the paramedical staff, and in different uh, images coming from different geographical location. If you looked at the performance of the algorithm for a moderate uh, or plus diabetic retinopathy, where it's a referable DR, the sensitivity at the Arvind was 88%, and the specificity of 92 and the same uh, in Shankarnetralia was around 92 and 95. For DME, it was also very high for the uh, referable DME in both uh, Arvind and uh, Shankarnetralia data. So it was very clear to show that the AI was working much better with the uh, human graders or the retina specialist grading in comparison to the ground, uh, the truth. So. So what's the next to determine whether the use of this algorithm could lead to an improved care and outcomes compared with our standard grading systems? So it's one of the most hotly debated topics. Everybody is talking about not only in healthcare, but in all fields, including judiciary, that AI being used. And it's not going to displace us, it's going to only enhance us, as enhance our work in, in future. I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Kim. That's heartening the closure that it's not going to replace us, it's going to enhance us. So the next we have Dr. Mark Gillis, and he would be speaking on the new frontiers in the management of retinal diseases. Thank you, and it's an honor to present to this distinguished society. So I'll be reporting today on two Australian phase four randomized clinical trials for near vascular macular degeneration, both of which used a treat and extend regimen of the fluid and the rival studies. These are my co-authors co who were the steering committee for both studies. So uh, Novartis came to us a few years ago and said, would you like to do clinical trials? We said in, in Sydney, we said, uh, we'd uh, be interested to see whether one of these new agents caused more geographic atrophy. Whereas in Melbourne, um, they asked what were the outcomes of tolerating subretinal fluid? My financials. <clears throat> so as we all know, the CAT study reported a uh, increased rate of atrophy, about 25% in eyes receiving monthly injections, statistically more than in the eyes receiving PRN. So we wondered whether this new agent of flibercept, if it was stronger, it might cause more atrophy. So we set up this study, and the basic design is similar for the two studies. There is a loading dose uh, for three, four weekly injections, and then a treat and extend regimen, which was controlled by the reading center, which was masked to the treatment allocation. In rival, the primary objective was the growth in the area of atrophy over 24 months, but we had key secondaries on the number of injections and the visual acuity improvements. Uh, the baseline characteristics in rival were generally well balanced. I'll draw your attention to the mean visual acuity, which was 65 letters for both groups. This is the best that's ever been reported at 615 or 2050, uh, which is better than the finishing vision in the view one and view two studies that reported these big 10 letter gains. So we did not expect to see large improvements on top of this good baseline. 
Primary outcome, you can see here graphed uh, that there's a bit of atrophy to start with, ranibizumab in gold, aflibercept in green, uh, a bit more in the aflibercept eyes at one year and a bit more in the ranibizumab eyes at two years. If you look at the primary, uh, the primary outcome uh, as uh, the statistical analysis was uh, prospectively specified, the square root area of uh, macular atrophy, it grew around the same rate at 0.36 millimetres on the bottom row there for ranibizumab, 0.28 millimetres for aflibercept, P equals 0.24, so it was not statistically significant. Uh, if, Another thing that is easy to understand in the, the uh, outcome that the CAT investigators tracked is the development of new geographic atrophy over time. We also call this the Donger study. And on the lower row here, you can see that that occurred in 29% of eyes receiving ranibizumab compared to 25% receiving a flibicept. P was 0.55. In terms of injection numbers, we found exactly the same number of injections, uh, somewhat to our surprise, over the first year at 9.7 injections per year. This is quite a high number and reflects how severely the Reading Centre judged activity. Uh, over the course of the two years, it was very similar numbers. The sample subfield thickness was also, a, 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 sorry, the visual acuity changes were similar amongst the two groups. Uh, ranibizumab sort of led the way, it trended towards ranibizumab. This is because uh, at week four, the aflibercept eyes stumbled out of the blocks. We're not sure why the cookie crumbled that way in this study, uh, but it was a high baseline and uh, none of these uh, differences were statistically significant at any point. And after two years on the bottom row, uh, we had a 6.6 .6 letter gain in the ranibizumab treated eyes, 4.6 in aflibercept. P equals 0.15, no significant difference. But note that we got the majority of patients into the 612 uh, reading and driving range. Uh, uh, for the central subfield thickness, uh, in fact, there, there was a similar result between the two, uh, trending towards uh, in favour of a flibicept in this case. Uh, and on the bottom line, after two years, there's a 161 micron reduction on average in the ranibizumab treated eyes compared to 173 in the aflibercept treated eyes, P equals 0.23. The only significant result we found was the plasma VEGF levels. Uh, this shows the, uh, the uh, picogram per mil uh, one week after the first and the second injections. Uh, so on the bottom row here, there's very little change in ranibizumab. Uh, in the flibicept, that dropped 20, 27 picograms. Uh, that was statistically significant, but we're not certain what the significance of this is. Um, uh, it did not translate into an increased risk of arteriothrombolic events. In fact, if anything, uh, it was more towards that ranibizumab at 7.8 uh, versus 5% for a flibicept. These are the sorts of numbers you find in these studies. So in summary, we found no difference and no indication that one agent lasted any longer in terms of number of injections. Uh, the atrophy, drying, and visual acuity results were similar, but trended in favor of more drying with the flibicept, a bit less atrophy, a bit better vision with uh, uh, ranibizumab. So now to fluid, where Robin Geimer was the PI. Uh, these are her disclosures. So uh, we were have these eyes where they've just got subretinal fluid and we used to cane these eyes with four weekly injections trying to get rid of it. Is that really necessary? Uh, results from clinical trials have shown, for example, in the CAT study that um, uh, monthly ranibizumab dried out the eyes much better than PRN ranibizumab. Twice as many would dry at the end of the study, but the visual acuity outcomes were the same. In the Fight Retina Blindness Treatment Outcomes Registry, we grouped eyes into quartiles depending on how many visits had been graded as active. And eyes that were graded as active in fewer than 25 visits, so these are the bone dry maculas, had four times the risk of developing atrophy than the eyes that were active at most visits. So the primary objective in this study was to compare a relaxed uh, regimen where you tolerated and indeed extended eyes that they only had up to 200 microns of subretinal fluid compared to a conventionally treated intensive fluid management. A similar uh, dosing regimen. 
24 month outcomes, we found similar visual acuity outcomes at one year and two years, uh, trending for the, actually the relaxed arm at one year uh, and for the um, strict arm at the second year, but none of these differences were statistically significant. And note these are small gains here, only three or four letters in this study. The number of injections was significantly, uh, statistically fewer at one year, at uh, two years um, in the ranibizumab treated eyes. It wasn't a big difference, but this of course includes the induction phase, and we expect the difference would become greater with time. Uh, interestingly, if you look at the extension intervals, at month 24, the number of eyes on four weekly injections was around 15% in the intensive group, but hardly any in the relaxed group and uh, the eyes that could make it out to 12 weekly were 30% in the relaxed group compared to around half that number in the uh, intensively treated group. In terms of subretinal fluid presence, there were a few eyes that had more than 200 microns at the foveal centre, but actually only five visits in the entire study, and at three of these visits there was also intraretinal fluid, so they were undoubtedly active. Uh, on the other hand, around 69% of the subjects in both groups had subretinal fluid of less than 200 microns as the only indication of activity at some point in the study. So in conclusion, uh, we found that uh, using this treat and extend uh, protocol with ranibizumab that tolerated subretinal fluid, we found similar visual acuity outcomes uh, to eyes that had been treated uh, in a more uh, intensive way uh, with significantly fewer injections of ranibizumab, and we think this has practical implication for the management of our, of our patients, certainly based on these data in Australia. We're tending to tolerate subretinal fluid, not reduce the interval between injections, and in fact extend if that's the only evidence of activity. Thanks for attention. Thank you, Dr. Mark, and I think that sort of corroborates and uh, formalizes what in real world situation many of us have been doing about tolerating some amount of subretinal fluid in treating our patients and Dr. Bailey Freund also referred to that. So the final talk of the session, we have uh, Dr. Sakamoto, uh, he'll be speaking on artificial intelligence based analysis of the choroid. Thank you very much. Uh, one hour ago, I found my computer was broken, so that almost killed me. It, it was Japanese computer, so next time I have to buy Indian computer. But I lost some images, but I could make it. And I'd like to talk about it, artificial intelligence-based analysis of colloid, focusing on quantification of colloidal vessels of unfaced images in pachycoroid eyes. This is my disclosure. As you know well, colloid plays an important role not only in retinal diseases, retinal colloidal diseases, and the introduction of EDI OCT or SSOCT has opened a new method, new avenue to perform colloidal research, as you know well. Uh, this is an example. In CSCI's colloid is sick, fellow eye colloid is sick, but looking at more carefully, vascular lumen is enlarged in outer retina. But on the other hand, in the retina, vascular lumen is decreased. b scan image is good, but it is not necessarily sufficient for quantitative research of the choroidal vessels. For example, uh, this is, uh, uh, left slide shows, uh, this uh, is a b scan image of eye. Uh, we developed a software uh, to uh, segment the choroidal layers automatically and uh, the rumen and the stroma automatically. But this is not enough for the vascular research. Looking at the C-scan image from this single scan, you can see the vascular lining pattern, diameter of vessels, and it's uh, the branching of pattern or something. This is great. But still, there is a difficulty in obtaining the reproducible and meaningful C-scan Amphas image that can be used for choroidal research. It is necessary to determine the same slab from the same way in an objective way. Looking at, uh, this is a C-scan image from the uh, hollow layer of the same eye. Dependent on the depth of the uh, colloid, 
its lining pattern, vascular lining pattern changes significantly. If you use the uh, depth of the slab uh, uh, using the distance from the retinal pigment epithelial layer, if I choose a 75 micrometer below the RP layer, this is an image from the semi before the treatment, after the treatment. Colloidal structure changed significantly. That 75 micrometer doesn't mean anything. And you may ask, you can use both B skin image and C skin image if you identify the border depth using B skin image. However, B skin image from uh, the border between the layer is undulating significantly, so it doesn't make sense. And looking at the pattern of C skin image carefully, there is a specific pattern. For example, Coriocapillaris shows granny sand pattern, Sattler's layer shows short curled spaghetti patterns, Halal's layer shows dominance of dark area pattern. Making use of this information, we can make a machine to indicate the depth of the uh, colloid. Uh, we arrange the, uh, this layer from the top of the retina until the depth, uh, bottom of the uh, colloid uh, in serially and teach this information to the machine. Machine learns its pattern automatically, and this machine tells you your image belongs to which layers. I don't have time to explain this algorithm, but I can tell you the result. This blue line indicates the uh, result of our support vector machine. This red line is a teacher data. So these two lines go together almost equally. That means our machine worked perfectly. And from our preliminary data, superficial 25% slab of halal layer is most suitable to, switch, uh, to analyze the uh, vascular running pattern. And additionally, we developed another new software to analyze C scan image of cloud. Uh, let, let me show you. Uh, we put the ID number of the patient, and this machine takes the image from uh, the reserved data. And this is the most important step uh, remove the noise and binalize the image. scrutinize automatically and measure the vascular diameter and how it runs. And these vessels are running symmetrically across the line or something. And you can put what you want, making your own algorithm into this machine. I'm sorry. In short, this software extracts objective and quantitative data in terms of length of vessels, diameter of vessels, how many vessels run symmetrically across the border, and many others. And this is an example. This is from the normal eye. This is from the pachycloid eyes. Our software shows what percent of uh, vessels run symmetrically across this line. Uh, this is 58.8%, this is 49.2%. And uh, this is a method. Uh, Amphas image were acquired uh, with Topcon SS OCT machine uh, with flattening on uh, Brooks membrane. And Amphas image of 25 uh, superficial slab of Halas layer was selected by AI and analysis was performed uh, using this software uh, on normal volunteers, 172, and Paki for 164. And result was clear. Uh, this is indi uh, red indicated Paki eyes, this blue indicated normal eye. This is age, this is the area of no, uh, luminal area, and this indicates age, this is a um, mean vessel diameter. Luminal area decreased with age, and mean vessel diameter was preserved regardless of age. And this is not surprising. 
uh, the thickness of uh, colloid, central colloid is greater in pachy colloid as uh, than normalized. But symmetric vesicle ratio, normal eye, this is opposite, normal eye run, vessel runs more symmetrically than pachy colloid eyes. And March regression analysis shows a larger luminal area, larger uh, mean vessel diameter, and lesser degree of symmetric vascular running uh, pattern of a halas layer were significantly associated with eyes pachycroid. And taking these data together, we can propose another you know, definition of a pachycroid eyes. And cutoff line can be drawn uh, 175 micrometer. If it is larger than that, it can be pachycroid. If it is smaller, it can be uh, control eyes. Accuracy is 90%. In summary, Objective and quantitative evaluation of colloidal vascular structure with machine learning method is presented. I predict each method of research can be replaced by AI, step by step. And pachycoroid was associated with greater luminal area and larger vessel diameter of halas layer than normalized. And I with pachycoroid has less symmetrical pattern in vessel running. And additionally, Artificial intelligence, as I said, will be applied to many research studies more easily, rapidly, and aggressively. At the beginning, it took one year to make this AI machine, but now I can make it within several days. And this will then accelerate our research mark tree. And from my experience, I'm in charge of uh, you know, national project of uh, big data and AI in Japan, supported by Japanese government. After 10 years, we will discuss about how to protect doctors from AI more seriously. And Bas, Bas, I have a question. When AI is dominant to doctor, what American doctors say about that? No, no, no. Make doctor great again. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Tashi. So before we go for lunch, we have a couple of housekeeping announcements. This checkout, leave your luggage at the cons range, and the transport will be immediately after the meeting is over at 6 p.m. Also, we have a photograph for all of us planned during the tea break. So we will announce it's by the poolside. So be here and now enjoy your lunch. Thank you.